Greetings everybody and welcome to the latest episode of the RISC 4.0 video blog series. In this particular episode we aim to explore a number of well-known risk concepts which seem to have become more prevalent in the last year. In particular I've noticed that a lot of blogs have been talking about these risk phenomena in terms of what they mean for the global pandemic that we have been experiencing. Um, and it's become evident that there seems to be a certain level of confusion and perhaps misrepresentation around these four critical concepts. And I thought it'd be great just to have a conversation around them um, and talk about uh, where they came from, some of the leaders in this particular area, and what they mean for modern day risk management. So let's start by going through each of them one by one and just see where the conversation takes us. So the first concept is probably that of a black swan. Um, it's probably the best known of the four. Uh, it was popularized by uh, Nassim Taleb in his book, The Black Swan, which is generally regarded as one of the best modern day risk management books of all time. Um, and essentially what a black swan attempts to describe is a high impact, low probability event. And this includes such risks as market crashes, an asteroid hit, a plane crash, randomness, false positives, bias assumptions, and the like. And it comes from the premise that for centuries in Europe, people didn't believe that a black swan existed. They'd never seen one. There was only white swan. And so there was a lot of literature around the time referring to the rareness or the non-existence of a black swan. And it was only around the 1700s when they got to Australia that a Europeans actually discovered that black swans did indeed exist. And, and they're actually quite prevalent in places like Australia. Um, and the key learning there was that just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist or that it won't emerge at a later date. So this became the fundamental notion of a black swan event. Now, Taylor tends to argue in his book that it's, it's best not to attempt to predict black swans because they are essentially highly unpredictable. So it's, it's rather better to try and build up a resilience to their potential negative impacts by doing two things. And the first one is actively eliminating internal vulnerabilities. And the second is fully exploiting opportunities when they present themselves. And it's the basic concept of a bomb shelter. Um, you know, in World War II, it became almost impossible to determine when, where, how, and what magnitude bombs were going to be dropped on certain cities. So the cities went around and built bomb shelters that, the bomb shelters that could basically withstand the force of 99% of the known bombs out there. And then it became unnecessary to predict when, where, and how a bomb was going to land. You just knew that you had a bomb shelter that was strong enough to withstand that. And that's essentially the premise that is explored in the Black Swan book and in Black Swan thinking. The second concept that um, has become popularized in the last year is the concept of a gray rhino. Now, this has actually been around for a while, but like I said, it's just become popular in the last year. Um, and essentially, a gray rhino is a slow moving, rapidly escalating threat, or it's a highly obvious but neglected threat. And this includes things like climate change, pandemics, digital disruption, social revolution, chaos. And the reason they call gray rhino is because it works on the fundamental premise that if you've ever traveled to Africa and, and been fortunate enough to see uh, rhinoceros grazing on the plains of Africa, you'll notice that they're incredibly docile creatures at first. In fact, you can get quite close up to them. And this tends to give people a false sense of security as to exactly how dangerous they are. And it's been a number of recorded cases where people actually climb out the vehicle and attempt to get closer up to the rhinoceros to get a picture or even some bizarre cases try and pat the animal. And before they know it, the animal turns and starts charging at you. So the concept of a gray rhino is this seemingly docile, slow moving threat, which emerges rapidly out of nowhere. So it, it's become more popular in the last year uh, since Michelle Wooker has written her book on the gray rhino and she talks extensively about uh, the topic. Um, and she argues that gray rhinos are actually created by systemic biases and psychological limitations. In fact, she goes into quite a bit of detail about them. She says, the reason that we feel the so false sense of security or the reason that we don't feel the need to address a gray rhino quickly is because we lull ourselves into some sort of a psychological comfort zone that it's not a problem and we pretty much ignore it for the longest time and then all of a sudden it escalates rapidly into crisis and we find ourselves actually dealing with the crisis rather than actually mitigating 
the risk. And obviously, that has great connotations for what we saw happen in 2020 with the pandemic. Uh, we were warned about this for decades before. All the major global risk reports talked about the escalations of pandemics. We also saw that the market signals had told us in the 20 years leading up to 2020, there'd been a rapid escalation in the number of viruses around the world that could escalate to pandemic from HIV AIDS to Hong Kong flu to SARS, MERS, SWAN flu, bird flu, you name it. We had had repeated warnings of this happening and most countries didn't do anything about it. They completely ignored the warning signs and it was only when that grey rhino came rapidly running at us that we jumped into action. So Wooker talks very much about these psychological barriers and she argues that in order to acknowledge a grey rhino there needs to be sufficient intelligence, diversity and originality in the associated threat analysis and decision making. The next concept that we probably need to review is that of a Dragon King. Again, this has been a while uh, around a while. It was made popular uh, by Didier Sonner, um, and he's wrote, written extensively on the topic, um, mainly in terms of economic and financial crashes. But essentially, a Dragon King is a unique but extreme event. In other words, an adv adverse event. And it's a dragon because it's highly unique, and it's a king because it's top of the food chain. It's, it's the biggest of its kind. And to give you examples, uh, the Black Monday stock, stock market crash of 1987, it wiped out 10 years of investor gains in a single day. Uh, the Lehman Brothers collapse of 2008 um, is, is, is twice as big as the second largest collapse of all time. So again, Dragon King. The five largest epidemics in history have 20 times the fatalities of the next 1,000. So a Dragon King is essentially this big once in a, a generation event that can never be duplicated easily. Uh, so Sonnet argues that the more complex a system, the more opportunity for extreme consequences to materialize within a single event. In fact, in his books, he goes quite a lot into complex systems theory. And if you've been following my series, you'll see I'm a proponent of it. I've argued many times that the future of modern day risk management lies in the complexity sciences. And Sonnet seems to agree and, and writes extensively on, on this topic. He even goes to say that because this is complex system driven and because they're highly uh, systems such uh, sorry complex systems are highly unpredictable uh, agile and evolutionary um, again it's most of these are unpredictable uh, in terms of long term forecasting thus constant vigilance and hyper alertness is required for observing emergent system signal and that is why many people who play in the markets are watching the data in real time to look for these emerging signals that apply something's coming so you know if you want to deal with dragon kings you've got to get good data and you've got to be a lot more alert and hyper aware to to the possibility of these uh, emerging threats and complex systems then the fourth one is another one that has been around as, as early as the 70s, wicked problems. Um, and essentially what a wicked problem is something that has a fundamental resistance to resolution. And this includes such things as pandemics, computer viruses, social macro issues such as poverty, prejudice, crime and terrorism. Um, in all of those cases, uh, numerous controls and solutions have been presented to solve these problems but all that ends up happening is that the problem reshapes and reforms and comes back at you uh, in, in a different format which requires a different level of thinking or a new control. Um, we saw this in the pandemic crisis uh, roughly March 2020 everybody rushed into mass global lockdown to try and stop the spread of the virus and all that happened is we got a three-month sort of um, you know, leeway where, you know, the, the threat actually died down. And then, you know, three months later, it came back at us with a much greater force. We saw second and third waves that were significantly more uh, fatalistic and significantly longer and, uh, and more prolonged. And that is classic wicked risk. So wicked risk is a risk that is continually changing, continually adapting. No one control solution can deal with it. Now, it first came out of um, some planning theory uh, made popular by Rattel and Weber, uh, roughly 1973 and they coined this term in the context of planning for complex problems which either have a fundamental lack of current data 
or the data changes too frequently to be reliable. So that continuous evolution and change is what makes it a, a highly wicked problem. Um, the two, Rattel and Weber, they argue that wicked problems require high degrees of real-time intelligence, collaboration, and agility in applying control solutions. So again, this is very complex systems theory based. It's very popular in complex problem resolution, uh, very popular in, uh, in mega project planning. So if we compare these four risk phenomena to some of the greater macro threats that we've experienced in recent time, we may see a comparison. For example, the difference between black swans and gray rhinos. The GFC was definitely a black swan. I know there are some people who claim that it was predictable, but everything's predictable at some level. The reality is though, the sheer number of institutions that were caught by surprise and were bankrupted because of it suggests that this was unforeseeable, therefore it was a black swan. The coronavirus, definitely a, a gray rhino. As I said earlier, there were decades of warning this was coming and you know for the 20 years leading up to 2020 there were numerous emerging signals telling us that a global pandemic was coming we just chose to ignore it the great global lockdown and, and just to be clear on the difference the, the coronavirus pandemic is the reference to the number of fatalities and um, infections that we experience whereas the great global lockdown is a reference to the number of follow-up systemic knock-on effects like increased poverty increased unemployment increased social issues and the like so although the coronavirus itself wasn't a black swan what was a black swan was the great global lo lockdown nobody could have reasonably predicted that the way that we were going to respond to the coronavirus was to shut down the entire world shut down all our financial ecosystems and lock down as much as half to two-thirds of the world's population in some sort of a uh, you know collaborative house arrest scenario nobody could have foreseen in fact nobody did because there was no pandemic plan out there national pandemic plan out there that suggested that this is what we were going to do this was a complete black swan Dragon Kings, well, the GFC was definitely a Dragon King. Uh, more mortgage bond losses and net losses were caused in that one uh, event than you know, numerous market crashes leading up to it. The Great Global Lockdown, although it's not a Dragon King right now, it seriously does have the potential to become a dra Dragon King. Numerous major institutions like UNICEF, the World Economic Forum, are warning about long-term effects which could actually end up being generational. Uh, effects that could in, in, um, you know, negatively impact future generations, our children, their ability to get employed, the ability to actually raise debt, uh, their education levels and so So the great global lockdown as a stand has significant potential to become a generational dragon king. Wicked problems, well, coronavirus, all viruses, and, and the great global lockdown, definitely wicked problems. They are continually morphing new strains, new problems, uh, new areas of concern. They are continually changing and creating new systemic knock on Highly complex, highly adaptive problems, so they're definitely wicked. Now, if we take this thinking and we try and apply it to many of the risks that were uh, published in this year's uh, World Economic Forum Global Risk Report for 2021, well, then the comparison might look like as such. Uh, on the left-hand side, we could probably put all the big ticket items that we were warned about in the 2021 report. And on the uh, y-axis, we could put our four risk phenomena. And I think we see the comparison looks something like this. And you, you're welcome to argue this for yourself, but this is my, my shot at it. Um, I think what you'll notice straight away is that, that there are significantly less black swans than there are gray rhinos. In fact, many of the macro threats we're facing are probably more gray rhino than black swans. Uh, many of them have the potential to become once in a generation Dragon King uh, adverse type risks. And most of them are actually wicked. So I think the key learning here is, is that we're not living in a simple state world anymore. The kind of risk that modern governments, modern organization, and even uh, people within modern societies are experiencing are highly complex, highly disruptive, highly wicked. And what this tells us is that the risk management game has to improve. We need to get significantly better than we have been in the past. And if you've been following my series, this has been one of the core themes all the way through. The way we have controlled risk, our understanding of risk, the way we've looked at risk up until the has to change. It, it has to advance. We need to start thinking more in terms of complex systems. We need to start thinking more in terms of resilience. So I personally think there's a lot of work that the modern day risk professional needs to actually engage in and, and, and I hope that this presentation has uh, proved that to some extent. 
So having said that, that's probably a good segue to actually close this particular episode off. Um, as always, if you enjoyed this particular episode, please look for some of our previous episodes. They're on all the usual forums. And equally, uh, perhaps look out for some of our future episodes. Um, you know, I'll keep doing this every couple of weeks, every time I can find some time. And um, you know, if you enjoyed, by all means, follow us. And until next time, um, good luck and keep safe. Thank you.